Our scripture this morning is, is from Romans 7. Romans 7 at verse 14 and through half of verse 25. Word of God. We know that the law is spiritual, but I am unspiritual, sold as a slave to sin. I do not understand what I do, for what I want to do, I do not do, but what I hate, I do. And if I do what I do not want to do, I agree that the law is good. As it is, it is no longer I myself who do it, but it is sin living in me. For I know that good itself does not dwell in me, that is, in my sinful nature. For I have the desire to do what is good, but I cannot carry it out. For I do not do the good I want to do, but the evil I do not want to do, this I keep on doing. Now if I do what I do not want to do, it is no longer I who do it, but it is sin living in me that does it. So I find this law at work. Although I want to do good, evil is right there with me. For in my inner being, I delight in God's law. But I see another law at work in me, waging war against the law of my mind and making me a prisoner of the law of sin, which is at work within me. What a wretched man I am. Who will rescue me from this body that is subject to death? Thanks be to God, who delivers me through the Lord, through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Let's pray. Father, to understand, we pray. And even more than that, for power from the Spirit to live the new life you have called us to live. This we indeed pray. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. Most of us are fairly good at making excuses. So when we go to school, we have an excuse for why we didn't get our homework done. Um, when we're at work, we can give an excuse as to why we arrived late. When we're at home, we can excuse why we didn't do what we said we were going to do. We can come up with a good number of excuses for the things that we do and do not do. Sometimes some of us even attempt to do that with officers of the law. Have you ever done that? Kind of excused maybe the way that you are driving? My, my first year's driving, I really didn't get stopped too often. That, 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 that went pretty well. I don't know if I was just being really cautious and law-abiding citizen, so I, I didn't have police officers stop me very often. It, it seemed like it wasn't until I became a minister that police officers started looking for me. And I would get stopped doing official clergy business, official ministry business. There's a guy who knew he even put a sign in his card, official uh, clergy business. Uh, to me, that would be about the most dreadful thing in the world to do. But that's what he did. He put that sign in his window. So anyway, almost every time I got stopped, I, I was doing ministry. I, I was busy at work, and I just wasn't paying attention or whatever. One time it was a little bit embarrassing that, uh, that I got stopped right in the church parking lot, and that shouldn't have happened, but, but it did. But I always had an excuse for it. I always had a reason for it, you know? I was, I was doing important things. Last time I got stopped, thankfully it's been a few years, so I'll get stopped tomorrow, but anyway, um, I got stopped in Hudsonville, and, and, and I turned and went down the road, and next thing I know, the sirens are going, the lights are flashing, officer pulls us up behind me and I said what did I do he said you turned red on that light didn't you see that sign I said no I, I, I didn't see the sign he gave me a ticket anyway the sign's gone now they took the sign down come on that's not fair that's not right anyway I'll try not to be bitter over it but but we have our excuses right we're pretty good at making our excuses. Well, that's why I did. I was really in a hurry. I had to get there. We make our excuses. Sometimes, sometimes we make excuses for the way we live or don't live our Christian lives, too. 
We have excuses uh, as to why we don't live the way that maybe God wants us to live, why we don't follow Jesus more closely. And some people, some people refer to this passage, they'll refer to Romans 7 and say, here's my excuse, this is why. One of my teachers, one of my very best teachers, if not my best teacher ever, in seminary was a man named Andy Banstra. He taught New Testament at Calvin Seminary for many, many years. He just passed away this past year. And he, um, he, he studied this passage in depth and wrote about it. And first, though, he, he told a story. This is the story he told that he connected with this passage. The minister and an elder are going out to visit George Black. The deacons have complained that George has not contributed anything to the budget for many years. And as far as they know, and they have watched, while the collection plates were being passed, he hasn't contributed anything to any other worthy cause. So the minister and the elder agree to speak to him about it. Minister, brother, don't you believe that the law commands us to tithe? George, yes, reverend, I do. Minister, somewhat surprised. Well then, don't you think it would be a good thing for you to tithe? George, indeed I do. For as Paul says in Romans 7, I delight in the law of God my inmost self. But you see, Reverend, it is just at that point where, as Paul also says, I find sin crouching at the door and I find another law in my members. It is that other law that tells me not to tithe, and it always wins out. Like that, huh? Minister, but don't you think you should serve the law of God? George, oh yes, and I do serve the law of God with my mind, but with my flesh I serve the law of sin, as Romans 7.25 seems to imply. Minister, it seems to me, my good man, that you are proud of the fact that you don't tithe and do not give. George, oh no, Reverend. The fact is, as Romans 7 also implies, I hate what I do, and I do not even acknowledge it as my own. It is really sin in me that is doing it. Besides, you remember what the Heidelberg Catechism says, but can those who are converted to God keep the commandments perfectly? And the answer that gives me so much comfort is this, no. In this life, yeah, come on. No, in this life, even the holiest have only a small beginning of this obedience. Reverend, if Paul had only a small beginning in all modesty, I must say that I have even less than he. So you see, that is why I do not tithe and why I do not give. That was his explanation. And Andy's point, when he got done telling the story, was this. You can't turn to Romans 7 and use it as an excuse for not doing what God wants you to do. Now, I've got to be honest with you here and say that there are two different interpretations of that passage that we read. One major interpretation says that the Apostle Paul is talking about his life right now in the present tense. And you can see why you would think that because as you read through the passage, it is in the present tense. And the Apostle Paul says, this is my problem. I'm not doing what I'm supposed to be doing and, and um, I'm doing some things I shouldn't be doing. And, and, and I keep struggling. I've got this, this tug of war going on inside of me that God wants me to do one thing and, and, and I do another. And, and it keeps on going on. And so when you read through this passage, it, it sounds very much like Paul is saying, this is happening to me right now today. It sounds that way. It, do, it does. A second reason I think that people think that this is the Apostle Paul talking about his current Christian experience is because we get it. We relate to it. I read this and I hear the Apostle Paul saying, God wants me to do these good things, but I don't always do them. God doesn't want me to be doing some of these things, but I find myself doing them. That sounds like me. I can relate to that. I get it. And so can most of you. You say, what is it? 
God has been working in my life. He's called me to be a believer. He's enabled me to follow Jesus, but I'm not all that good at it. I'm trying to follow Jesus, but I don't always do what he wants me to do. I don't always say what he wants me to say. I don't always live the way he wants me to live. That sounds like me. And for many of us, we read that passage and say, how can it be anything different? The Apostle Paul has the same problem that I have. I want to serve God. I want to do what God wants me to do, but I don't always do it. I do it sometimes, but not always. I have good days and I have bad days. Sometimes I feel more faithful than other days. Sometimes. Sometimes. And so you read through a passage like that, and, and we know that it's not writ written to pat us on the back and say, well, the Apostle Paul wasn't very good at being a Christian, neither are you, so you should feel good about it. It, 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 it just can't be why it was written, not to excuse us. There are other people who think that what the Apostle Paul is talking about here, he's talking about what it was like before he became a Christian. And the reason they think that is because if you take a look at this bigger section of Scripture, especially Romans 5, 6, 7, and 8, if you read through that entire section, 5, 6, 7, and 8, you'll hear that theme of victory throughout it. The Apostle Paul talks about what Jesus has done for him and the victory that we have in Jesus. So, for example, if you go back to chapter 6, if your Bibles are out, in chapter 6, uh, several different verses. Verses 1 and 2 first. What shall we say then? Shall we go on sinning so that grace may increase? By no means. We are those who have died to sin. How can we live in it any longer? So in that verse earlier in the same section, really, the apostle is saying, listen, we've already died to sin. So we shouldn't be living in sin. We shouldn't be doing these things. But then later on, he is saying, but I'm still wrestling with it. What's going on there? And so it makes some people think, as you read through this section, that the apostle is talking about what it was like when he was a Jewish person under the law, but not a born-again Christian person. So if you keep on going through what it says in those sections, you will see like in chapter 7, at verse 4, it says, So my brothers and sisters, you also died to the law through the body of Christ, that you might belong to another, to him who was raised from the dead, in order that we might bear fruit for God. You are fruit-bearing people because God has made you new through Jesus. And then in chapter 8, verse 1, it says, Therefore there is now no condemnation. And verse 25 of chapter 7, Thanks be to God who delivers me through our Lord Jesus Christ. And so you've got the interpretation that says, We have won the victory through Jesus. And what he's talking about is what it was like before that victory was won. Now there are good, solid, biblical interpreters that believe both of those interpretations that the Apostle Paul is talking about his current position as a believer and there are those who think that he's talking about what life was like before being a believer. So you can get both sides who wrestle with that. But here's the things. Number one is however we treat it, it wasn't written to give us an excuse to excuse our sin. God didn't write this so that we could say, Phew, you know, I'm not living the way God wants me to live, but neither did the Apostle Paul, so it's just fine. It's not written there as an excuse to justify us. Say, it's okay. It's okay. No matter how you interpret it, it's not there for that. But the truth of the matter is, when you read that, it sounds so much like us, doesn't it? It feels true. That I know that God wants something from me, that, that, that I, I know I'm only saved by God being kind and gracious and forgiving to me, but it still seems like I should be living better than I do. It leads to the second thing that we have to notice here. There's a real battle that takes place. 
There's a real battle that takes place in a Christian's life. If you're trying to follow Jesus, it's not easy. And the truth of the matter is, if you're a believer in Jesus, you, you do have, you still have a sinful nature. You have that old nature. It's still in you. And it still knows how to do wrong. And it's still always whispering in your ear, so to speak. So I may hear God whispering in my ear to come follow him, but I also have that stubborn, sinful nature that says, do what you want to do. You don't have to listen. You don't have to follow. You can do what you want to do. There's always that tension in a believer's life. And we wrestle with it. We do. It's there, and it's real. And no one in this lifetime totally outgrows it. But on the other hand, the Spirit of God dwells in believers. The Spirit of God dwells within us. And that's why that tension also takes place, that there are times when we follow Jesus. There are times when we do just what God wants us to do. There are times when we find ourselves living the new life. Both things are present in our lives. It was interesting earlier, earlier in the service when I read that line, are you able to live up to that law? Of course not. But then it goes on to say, I'm inclined to hate God and my neighbor. And there are a lot of people who say, hate? Well, that's an extremely strong word. I'm not that bad. I'm not inclined to hate God and my neighbor. Well, sometimes when you think about hate or hate, or, or put it this way, let's reverse it. Sometimes when you think about love, you think the opposite of it is hate, right? Love and hate are opposites. But I've had it described to me before that the opposite of love is not necessarily, is not necessarily hate, but the opposite of love can be apathy. You just don't care. I don't care that there are 10 million people right now who are starving to death. It doesn't matter to me. I don't care about my neighbor down the street and the problems that he's having. It doesn't matter to me a bit. And if you think in those terms, certainly, there's a lot of us who are a bit apathetic about the concerns of others and we're much more concerned about our own. It makes sense when I think of it that way. I think about me much more than I think about you. And I'll say this as well. It's pretty easy to love your neighbor when your neighbor's a good guy. But when your neighbor's a bad guy, he's not all that easy to love. So where are we? Going back. We can't use this passage as an excuse and say, I just can't help it. I can't do any better. It's not there for that. I know that. Secondly, let's recognize that there is always a battle going on in a believer's life. There are things that God wants us to do. There's a way that he wants us to live. It's a heart matter. And there's that battle that goes on. But third, it's a battle that we'll always lose if we depend on ourselves. But thanks be to God, because there is victory through the Lord Jesus Christ. It means if I try to attack this on my own, if I get really resolute and say that I'm going to beat this thing, whatever it is, I'm going to do better, I'm going to walk the path more, more faithfully, I'm going to say no to sin, I'm going to fight the, the greed, I'm going to fight the anger, I'm going to fight the lust, I'm going to win the victory over them because I'm dedicating myself to what will just keep stumbling and falling. We might get a little better along the way, but we aren't going to beat it. But thanks be to God through our Lord Jesus Christ, there is a way to victory, and it's through depending exclusively on him. Lord, I can't depend on me. I, I'll fail. I'll fail every time. I need you. I need you to see me through. And it's not just a one-time thing. 
It's not like one time I, I, I go to the Lord and say, Lord, I, I need you to win the victory of my life through Jesus Christ now and forever, amen. This is really a daily thing that every day of our lives, we, we, we don't try depending upon ourselves and saying, I can do this. But it's recognizing every day of my life, I'm going to stumble and I'm going to fall. And I'm going to sound exactly like the Apostle Paul if I'm trusting in me. But if every day my heart keeps turning back to the one who has rescued me and I keep depending upon him who died for me and whose spirit lives in me, then I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. Then I can begin to live that new life. One thing I know, God didn't give us this to make excuses, but by the power of his spirit, we can begin to live the lives he's calling us to live. May it happen, may it happen in your life and in mine. Let's pray together.